Oh shit. Here we go again. Hello and welcome out to this week's episode of Outbreak Gamers. I'm your host, Web Dave, David Anthony, big fat guy in a chair, whatever you want to call me. And I am very excited to have with us today, Paris Lilly. Paris, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing fantastic, sir. Thank you for inviting me. This has been a long time coming, but uh, excited to be here. Well, um, not as excited as I'm having you, I'll tell you that. <laughs> we were talking in the green room beforehand, and, and Paris is very gracious. And uh, and it is it is super nice to have you here uh, because, uh, you know, you're one of the members, uh, I guess, in the in the gaming community. Um, I have a lot of respect for. Uh, you've been on a lot of things. You've done a lot of things. You've, uh, you've, you've worked in different avenues, and it's your hard work and um, perseverance in the industry that's gotten where you are today. And uh, a good representation uh, for the gaming community as a whole. So, again, we appreciate that and uh, appreciate you being here and taking the time for today. Oh, of course. Thank you for having me again. All right. So let's get into this. I usually start off this way. And that is, um, like, what was maybe, like, your first job that you ever had, like, growing up? (laughs) My first job would have been I was a stock boy at Winn Dixie, which is a grocery store in the South. I am I am from uh, St. Petersburg, Florida. So nice. so the local grocery store was Winn Dixie. And my first job, I was a stock boy. And my aisle was pet foods and uh, like salad dressing. So all the condiments, salad dressings, ketchup, mustard, all that stuff. That was that was my aisle. That's what I was in charge of. I like that. I like that. That's, <laughs> and that's great. I had heard of Winn Dixie. We used to have one here a long time ago. I'm, I'm not sure if the franchise is still around, but it was. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Either. It started yeah. off kind of as a mom and pop thing and grew into a to a, to a, a localized franchise. I would say, like you know, one part of the country kind of thing. And uh, but yeah, it's um you know that's that's a respectable job. You got to start somewhere. Yep. Yeah, you know, people that do paperboy, fast foods. You know, I worked for my dad. Because he had his own business and he could, you know, <laughs> nepotism, whatever it takes. <laughs> but, you know, that's how you get started. So I guess, uh, you know, from there, um, as you started uh, getting getting older, did you, um, was there any, I guess, other jobs that stood out to you that uh, that, that you were, I guess, interested in or, or, or maybe along the lines of your education after, you know, after high school and such? Uh, United States Navy. Um, I, I did a brief stint in college and, uh, yeah, I was very young and immature back then. But um, my mother, God bless her soul, uh, kind of gave me an ultimatum because uh, I was kind of flaming out in college. It was, uh, if you're going to come back home, you either have to get a job, get out of my house, or go to the military. So I chose the military and uh, I joined the United States Navy. And it was probably the smartest decision I ever made in my life because it it, it provided discipline very needed discipline that I needed at that time in my life, uh, organization skills, um, social skills, um, being able to travel the world. Um, it really helped to shape who I am. And it was the gateway into what my job, my, my day job is to this very day. Um, I used to be attached to an aircraft squadron, uh, VF2. It was out, out of San Diego, California, Miramar. And uh, that was my first time basically getting into IT um, because I worked in flight deck control and I basically kept all the records for our, our, our our F-14 fighter, fighter jets, I can't even talk, sorry, but I kept all the records for all, basically all the maintenance times, flight times, all that stuff. And it Mm -hmm. was unit based uh, at that time. And then there was windows 3.11 that was coming out. And uh, I just kind of, backed into kind of being the IT person in, in the in the squadron. So when I got out of the military, um, I wound up getting a job, ironically enough, at uh, Sony Technology Center in San Diego. And I worked on the help desk. I started on the help desk. Then I was doing desktop support. Then next thing I know, I was doing operations in the data center. And I basically just kind of 
leverage that into I was working for San Diego County doing IT for them as well. Started doing system admin stuff, exchange administrator. Um, then I wound up going to Orange County. Uh, this was like mid 2000s. I know I'm telling mm-hmm. a long story, but it's all right. Go. That was that's what got me into uh, security and to cybersecurity. And um, that's what I've been doing ever since. So, yeah, that was like oh five. So, yeah, I've been doing security almost 20 years at this point. Wow. Now. But, that's fantastic. Um, but but the big thing about that is and it even kind of translate into stuff that I'm doing now with gaming. It's just about building relationships, man. It's all about who, you know, when, you know, you never know that person you meet today, how they might be able to help you tomorrow. Treat people with respect, the, the whole the whole thing. And that's just really helped me in my career the, the entire way. But, um, yeah, I mean, I mean. I I love doing security. I love being in technology. I love the problem solving and the critical thinking aspect of it. Mm -hmm. It's you on your toes. Um, In fact, I had an issue yesterday, which was kind of a head scratcher, but uh, it's, it's been fun. And I use gaming as kind of my escape from that. And uh, yeah, it's been good, man. It's, it's been a good run over the past few years. That's that's awesome. Well, I I do want to say this. Thank you for your service. Um, Because it's, um, you know, it's, it's very uh, Im- important uh, uh, to call out all vets, uh, no matter what level of uh, that you that you served in the military, and it's uh, it is greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for that. Um, so let us turn this to gaming. <laughs> You're like, oh no, what, what are we talking about gaming? Well, I don't want to be on the show, but, uh, but but I guess what was your first experience with gaming? I mean, was it like consoles, arcade, PC? How? What was your first like? <gasps> games i mean easy 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 it was the atari 2600 it was wasn't even really the atari 2600 it was because we're talking late 70s here so this was sears used to have their own version of the atari the whatever it was called i can't remember it was that and it was like pong and i remember combat those were the two things i remember um i would say beyond that it was absolutely the atari 2600 was the first console um, that that I had, you know, the Pac-Man, the Donkey Kong Adventure, all, all that stuff, the football game, all those mm-hmm. things was on the 2600 back then. Um, but the real bread and butter were the arcades for me. Um, yeah. I, I used to every, not every Saturday, but a lot of Saturdays, whenever my mom would give me the money, um, I would go to uh, arcade in, in my hometown. It was called Aladdin's Arcade at Tyrone Square Mall. And I would have like $10 worth of quarters and I would be in there all day just nice. playing games all day a game that just sticks out to me which when i think about modern gaming now and stuff that we do um is a game called frontline you were like a soldier mm-hmm. and and you're and, and i, I want to say it was it was definitely asian i don't want to say it was chinese or korean or whatever but but mm-hmm. basically the bad guys right and you would be on foot you would have your gun and you would shoot them on foot but you had the ability to jump into these tanks there's like a small tank you could jump into which was more like would shoot more like just machine gun bullets and then you had this big tank that was shooting like big missiles and stuff and it was like a top-down scroller and i just absolutely love that game and when i think modern games now where it let's just say like a halo 2 where you could you know chief could jump on a ghost and kick the guy out it was very similar to that then we're talking early 80s at this point mm. back then. But obviously, I, I was a huge Pac-Man fan, you know, Donkey Kong, Zaxxon, Defender, Space Invaders, Galaga, like all those early games of, of the late 70s and early 80s. Really, I just I just fell in love with gaming. And mm. then I'll take you to Christmas of 1985. Here we go. And this was my Red Rider BB gun moment. <laughs> my mother and, and and it's crazy and i've told the story before but it's crazy like i i don't know what prompted my mother to do this but she got me the nes for christmas and it was the deluxe set that came with rob the robot so it was duck hut and gyromite and oh, cool i remember like my memories are i remember that the nintendo was coming out i i, I knew of it but i wasn't asking for it. i wasn't like begging my mom like oh my god i gotta do this thing and she got it for me. To this day, I don't know what prompted that, that she did that. But she got that for me. And I remember it was Christmas Eve and my cousin just happened to be over. And she let me open it early. And, man, we ran into my room on my 10-inch black and white TV and played Duck Hunt 
all freaking night. I, I will never forget that. I just thought it was just the greatest gift that I ever got. And then a few months down the road, I remember I remember buying 10 yard fight. That was like a football game uh, yeah. that was on the NES at the time. And a few months after that, I remember getting Mario, Super Mario Brothers, life changing, game changer. I mean, that yeah. was just complete next level. Oh, my God, I didn't know gaming could be could be this way. Um, but it was funny thinking back to when I originally had the NES, like I said, had the gyro might rob the robot. I don't know if you ever had that or not, but I didn't have it, but I knew yeah. it. But anyone that had it back then, you you just cheated with gyro might because you're supposed to use Rob the Robot to to move like the these spinning tops over to these platforms, and that's how mm-hmm. you get the character to move. That was too complicated. It was like whatever, you just cheat with the controller and just do it. But <laughs> yeah, that duck hunt, but then once I got Mario. Man, it was just crazy. I remember games like Bionic Commando back then. Oh, yeah. Obviously, um, uh, what was the other one I'm thinking of that really just oh oh Mega Man, Mega Man, Mega Man Two. I mean, just Mike Tyson's Punch Out. Like it, it's it's so funny now that we're in this internet age and the social media age where we're so connected and we can communicate with each other and talk and pass this. Like back then, when you had a get like you'd be lucky to get one or two games a year if if, at most. Right. But back then we, it was the schoolyard with Mm -hmm. your friends and we'd be trading tips back and forth and we would go over each other's houses and, Oh, you got punch out, but I got mega man too. So then my friend or ice hockey, that was the other big one we used to love to play or obviously Tecmo bowl. We, Oh my God, weekends that we used to have (laughs) tournaments. The whole thing was crazy, but we would go to each other's houses because one kid would have one game, but the other one would have the other. And we would just go back and forth and trade off and you would have tips. Like I remember Mike Tyson's punch out. I could not get past bald bull to save my life. Like I'm, I'm talking, it, it was like weeks or months. And the super macho man was even worse than mm-hmm. that. It like took forever. I will, the satisfaction that I had finally beating Mike Tyson in that game is just something that sticks with me to this day. Like when you just think satisfying moments of achievement, like that felt like a huge achievement to me. Yeah. Now, now, you know, you know, all the tricks and you see the flash and when he blinks his eyes, you know what to do. But back then, man, it was like, there were no tips. Like you'd have to call the Nintendo power hotline or whatever. Right. You get in trouble with your parents. Cause it was the one nine hundred number. You're running up your bill. But uh, yeah, those, those days in the eighties with gaming, it just really cemented, me like I feel like I was the perfect age growing mm-hmm. up during that time because it was still early in the hobby. Developers were obviously still figuring out the gameplay mechanics, loop, like all these things were just so new. And every time a new game come out, it was always like, what's next? What what new thing are they going to be able to do? And you're seeing graphics start to improve the visual just everything about it obviously once we got into the super nintendo and genesis age with 16 bit like i had the turbo graph 16 box adventures like the only game i ever played on it but you know just things like that was just so awesome back then the 80s and, and into the early 90s and then to just watch how gaming has matured over the years to where we are here in 2023 to where our expectations are just out of control (laughs) our expectations and our entitlement and our demands on what we expect for gaming like if you would have told 10 year old me this is what gaming would be today i would not have believed you at all i I never i'll never forget when um super mario 64 came out on on the 64 i was like this is it it will never get better than this ever. This it's a freaking cartoon. It'll never be better than this. Mm-hmm. You look at it now, it looks archaic to go play Super Mario 64. Now the nostalgia of it's still there, but visually it actually just does not hold up. And that's just a credit to where technology is, you know, from a vis- visual standpoint. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If, if you were to like, like your 10 year old self, like you're talking about, if you were to imagine the leap from then to now and then yeah. imagine that time from now to the future oh my gosh what have we got to look forward to in the future you know what i mean yeah. mm-hmm. it's like wow um you know ready player one for real maybe yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so so yeah I, that's that's awesome um yeah i love the old classic games and stuff too you know i started off as the atari 2600 myself that was that was that was me too so uh so yeah, i'm right there with you on that and uh 
uh, man, what a, what an uh, it, it is actually an amazing time because a lot of people, uh, in kids today, um, you know, ones that are really teenage and stuff, and, and you try and show them, oh, this is a great classic game, and they're like, you know, ooh, what's that? Or, uh, and it's like, <laughs> you no idea. If it wasn't for this, you wouldn't have what you have now. You yeah, know, e- exactly. So. Like I, I, I still say to this day, like when people ask me what is my favorite game of all time, without hesitation, I say Super Mario Brothers Three. Nice. That is just the pinnacle of 2D platformers, and it still holds up to this day. It's it's crazy to think that game was what 1990, I believe mm-hmm. it came out, and here we are. I don't know, my math is bad. Was it 33 years later? Yeah, <laughs> and it it's still the king. It's still the king yeah. of platformers. I mean, like Super Mario Brothers Wonder is coming out on October 20. I'll be there day one to yeah. want to play, which, by the way, how the hell am I going to do all this, all these games coming out? But <laughs> um, I mean, that is just an evolution of what that game established. You know what I mean? And obviously yeah. we can take it back to the original Mario Brothers. But to me, Super Mario Brothers 3 just pulled in all these platforming elements and it was level design. Just everything about it was just it was perfect. And I and I think the beauty of it was the difficulty scaled so that by the time you got to World 8, man, it was chaos. By the time you got there, you know, the difficulty and but you were learning the mechanics along the way. And I think that was the beauty of, of that game. It was teaching you along the way so that as the difficulty ramped up, you were ready for it and you were prepared for it and you understood the different things that you were going to need to do to, to get through the level. So fantastic game. Like I said, still my number one to this day. I, I agree. It's, it, it was a very well done game. And and three, I think, was the one where you, right at the beginning of the game, there was a certain like a white block. If you stood on and you squatted down, you waited a couple of seconds, you would fall down and you'd be like in the background behind everything else. Yeah. And then yeah, you get right. to a yeah, secret yeah. zone. I'm like, what? Who yeah, thought of that? You know, <laughs> right, right. It, it's it's crazy. Yeah, and 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 on the I guess the original Super Mario Brothers, the first time I ever found a warp zone, it was by accident. You know, like right. you jumped and you're like, oh, well, I'm up here. Wait, I can still move. What am I doing? Yeah, and yeah. Keep going. Keep going. What does this lead to? And you're like, warp zones. <laughs> Holy Christ! You know, <laughs> yeah. And, and a lot of people don't know you were talking about Atari and an Adventure. That like Adventure was the very first game to ever have an Easter egg ever. Um, and that was, I, uh, I, I did not know that. I yeah. guess you're right. Yeah, I guess yeah, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of the first games. Yeah, <laughs> and and the thing was, at the, at, at the time, Atari didn't give credit to the developers or anything like that. There was no, you know, who made it or whatever. That, that to them didn't matter. You just keep mashing out the games, and uh, and so the, the the guy that actually made it put an Easter egg in, and when you actually do and trigger all the functions to make the Easter egg happen, there's YouTube videos you can watch and see how to do it. It's pretty simple, but it's mm-hmm. still kind of funny. Um, it's like an invisible key that you have to put in a certain place. And then it's just a, a little area opens up and it just has this like bunch of little colors, but yet it's his name appears and that's it. That's the whole Easter egg. It just right. so he could get right. credit and they didn't know it was in there until it was already done and mass produced and not everywhere. Yeah. So it's like, oops, but it gave him us a reason to go back and well, I got to play it more to get to that Easter egg. Oh, sorry about my dogs in the background. No, no they, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I guarantee happening. you mine will bark at some point. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Oh, uh, goodness. Well, um, I guess on with that, um, in your gaming, um, you know, being a gamer uh, and playing games, um, at some point, um, I guess, how did it get to uh, uh, to where you were, I guess, what did you, what were you, uh, YouTube and stuff like that started up, uh, different uh, avenues, uh, you know, was it like, you know, the podcast was early back then, I'm sure. So so what t- triggered that, um, that kind of <laughs> like, because I, 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 did you listen to some podcasts before you kind of dabbled in it? Or oh, how yeah. did that come about? Oh, yeah. So so actually, I'm going to take you back to 2001. Oh, that's good. I, I answered that. So okay. 2001, I hear that there's this thing called E3 where they show all these games and you can see all this stuff. Now, I'm a huge Nintendo fan. At this point, the GameCube's coming out that year. So I'm, I'm hearing about all this stuff and I, I live, you know, San Diego area. So I'm close to Los Angeles. So I'm like, how do you get in this E3 thing? Well, I see you can register. And if you're a part of the retailer media, right. you can get in. Now, I, again, I'm doing IT at this point. So I forged my registration to make it seem like my company had something to do with gaming. Yeah. And they and they gave me an exhibitor badge. So I went 
to, yeah, to E3 01. Now, like I said, I'm there for the GameCube. That's yeah. what I'm there for. I'm there to see Luigi's Mansion, Zelda, all that stuff. That's what I'm there for. It just so happened there was this other company at the same time called Microsoft who was debuting their gaming machine mm-hmm. called the Xbox. Now, I also take you back. I was a huge Dreamcast guy. Dreamcast was way ahead of its time. Yeah, There is no Xbox without the Dreamcast, in my personal opinion. Modern gaming, Man. where it is today, you do not have without the Dreamcast. My first online console gaming experience was NFL 2K or 2K1, whichever one it was, online trash talking on a keyboard yes over over a 56k modem or whatever yep. it was but anyways so i go to i go to e3 2001 mind just completely blown i'll never forget walking in i believe it was west hall but walking into west hall ea had their booth right there as you're coming in the door and as you walk in they had like this big jumbotron with madden on it and i'm just like in, it's like christmas dude i'm like oh my god this is amazing greatest thing ever seeing you know go to nintendo booth i'm seeing luigi's man like all this stuff i'm just blown away i walk over and actually i have these pictures on twitter um or x but i walk over to the xbox booth or the microsoft booth and i see this game there called halo and i'm like i would heard some rumblings about it the shooter mm-hmm. the game thing on console okay let's check it out now for context huge like golden eye perfect dark you know had played stuff on the nintendo 64 played on real tournament on the pc and stuff so you know i kind of got the whole shooter thing i go to play halo and it is a just a buggy mess like it's it is not good right then and there i go this this xbox thing's never this is this is gonna fail what are they doing this is never gonna work it'll never work I'm going back to the Nintendo booth. I'm done with this. This is this is going to fail. Go to November of that year. I just so happened to need to. I it was I needed a break at work and I needed to run to over to Comp USA. And um, it just so happened I'm going as Comp USA is opening, and it's the day that the Xbox is coming out. And there's all these people standing out, not out super lot, but there's people standing out. So what are these, all these people doing out here? And I walk up to the door because there's no organized line. And I'm like, what's going on? And they're like, oh, the Xbox is about to come out. And I'm like, that thing? <laughs> like, even in that <laughs> moment, I didn't care. Yeah. And then for whatever reason, as the door is opening, and I think it was just because of the timing that I was one of the first people to walk in because there's no line. I just right. one of the first people to walk in. And I go, you know what? screw it i'm gonna get this xbox i don't even know why i did it because i had no faith in it at all and i just i went ahead and bought it and i remember some people were mad like hey you just you cut my like dude there's no line I, I don't know i'm buying it whatever right yeah and i bought dead or alive three and i was like you know what i'll just get this halo thing <laughs> yeah now nah, just get it and i bought halo and i remember going home obviously setting it up i was playing dead or alive 3 i didn't touch halo for like a month and then i remember you know the gamecube came out a little bit after that and i think majora's mask was there was something i was completely distracted playing other stuff did Mm -hmm. not touch halo for a month xbox was getting very little use in my house and then one day i just decided you know what let's check out this halo thing because again remember internet's early back then you had to go in message form so i'm not following the chatter or anything so i'm not understanding the significance of what this game really is right so i remember playing that campaign and thinking oh my god this is amazing this is wow i didn't know you know story shooter a first person shooter game could be this fun you know on a console this is great so totally got addicted into halo next thing i know i'm setting up x-link kai and i'm doing online and i'm doing air quotes online uh, multiplayer matches and blood <laughs> gulch against people, you know, and you know, the lag is terrible, but you're still having a blast. And I just completely fell in love with halo. And it was that moment that I just really started to connect with, with Xbox. And I remember like, I think ghost recon because, because now, you know, we're transitioning into O2 and I got in the Xbox live alpha 
as they were testing it out. So this was kind of mid 2002. Nice. Playing like Revolt was like the big game that was on there. So I remember Revolt, you know, there's like the NFL. There's like all these online things that they had in the alpha and then the beta. Mm-hmm. And I remember you could do like the voice masking and all. You could talk to people like, oh, my yeah. God, you can talk to people. They talk. About, this is amazing. Like crazy. Yeah. Like, you know, um, fun trivia fact. Vicious 696 is because I was going to be vicious. Like I'm a huge Cowboy Bebop fan and Vicious is the villain of Cowboy Bebop. And I wanted to be vicious. That was going to be my gamer tag. Mm. That was a band name back then. So I couldn't do it. So oh. 696 was a, a Unreal Tournament clan I was in. It was part of the name. So I just put the two together and that's where that came from. So, and that was, yeah. So that was nice. <laughs> back in those early, early days. That's where Vicious 696 comes from. And I've just used it ever since. But um yeah just going through through that the alpha the beta and then obviously xbox live comes out at the end of o2 and game is just game changing I, again when yeah. we talk about modern gaming online console gaming i mean we do have to thank microsoft for that they were completely ahead of their time yes. you have to remember back in 2002 to say that you were only going to have a, a broadband ethernet connection was insanity mm-hmm. because there was not wide adoption of that mm-hmm. i remember even myself at my home, I mean, like I was saying, we're, we're, I was on a 56K modem. I upgraded to broadband at that time yeah, because of that, because yeah. I wanted to to be a part of that. And like I said, obviously, they're ahead of the time having the hard drive inside the Xbox and all that. So I'm, I'm saying all these things, and I know I'm long winded going back no. in time to now fast forward to 2005. Mm-hmm. At this point, I'm really into on like i'm a part of an online community gaming community where we get together on weekends and play all the time and all that stuff and it was like you know it was literally called the adult gamer because it was adults or you know, want to play with kids right and um so i'm having fun doing all that stuff i'm, I'm really engaged in online community playing rainbow six and just all, all these online games all that time i think call of duty was out at that time too but um i remember being there was a, a website called team xbox and i would be on their forums all the time and there's this guy in 05 on that's on there his name is godly godfrey what i don't know god what what, god something right godfrey but you know danny Payne. he's on there and he's promoting his podcast or at the time what we would call a podcast but he's promoting gamer tag radio Mm -hmm. i'm like what's this what's this audio the internet what is this why is he always spamming this on here and then he got uh, a huge scoop when the 360 was coming out that year. He knew some of the people, basically we would call them content creators now, but he knew some of the content creators that they had flown over to London to see Perfect Dark early. And they were at this, this pre-tape thing for the MTV reveal in L.A. He knew who they were. He got them to come on Gamertag Radio before the 360 was revealed on the show. Wow. And they spilled the beans on Perfect Dark and all this stuff about it. And I remember he posted it and I immediately grabbed it and, and listened to it. And I remember Xbox made, made him take it down, but I got to hear it. And that was kind of the thing that made me just like, you know what? Let me start listening to this Gamertag Radio. And at that point, I started listening to other gaming podcasts or whatever you want to call them back then dreamstation.cc was another one i used to listen to um who's now one of my good friends chris paladino was a host along with like 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 tom and chad and some other people but i would listen to these podcasts and like say i go on a walk or whatever i'm always listening to them so i'd really become a fan of gamer tag radio and dreamstation specifically so one day and this is this yeah this was 06 at this point now we're in 2006 I'm watching, it was called, I believe it was called on10.net or something. It was like a Microsoft thing, like an Xbox thing. And it was Laura Foy who, and oh my God, I always screw up her, 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 her last name now, but it was Tina Wood back then. And mm-hmm. it's Tina. So, so, oh my God. It, she's going to kill me if she ever hears me say this, but <laughs> she, she, she runs, she runs all the, all the event production for, for Xbox and all the shows. Right. So like yeah. even when I got to host the show, she, she's the boss. Right. Yeah, I see her every time. She's, she's some. Yep. I always screw up her last name, and I apologize for that. But anyways, <laughs> back in those days, they used to be on what became G Four. Jeff Key right. used to be on there, all that kind of stuff. But then they wind up working at, at Microsoft, and Laura Foy was interviewing Chris and Danny 
at this Lord of the Rings event that they were having up in Redmond and I'm, and they're on camera talking to him. And I'm like, Oh my God, you get to go to Xbox. You get to go. These things are on camera. They're talking to him. Like, dude, these guys are like celebrities. This is amazing. Yeah. And I remember a buddy of mine, I hit him up and I was like, Hey, I, I want to do this. I want to do this gaming podcast thing too. I got opinions too. It was like, let, let's do a podcast. And they were like, well, how do we figure out what to do? Hey, I'm going to email Danny and Chris. And that's exactly what I did. I emailed Danny and Chris kind of explained, Hey, big fan, see what you want to do. I want to start my own gaming show. Any, t- any tips that you have? Chris gets back to me right away and kind of like we're recording this on the Saturday morning. It's the same thing. Hopped on early Saturday morning and it was Skype back then. We're on Skype and he's walking me through, okay, here's here's the software recording equipment. Like it was Adobe Audition, which I still use to this day. And nice. like I said, you get to talk to people over Skype and obviously all that stuff is modernized and here's how you can edit and like everything. He gave me all the tips and here's what kind of microphones and it, it was all horrible back then, but he's giving me all these tips on what to do. So Danny winds up getting back to me like three weeks later i think he was on vacation or something i always joke on him that he was big time in me but he he was on vacation (laughs) um and basically same thing kind of just here's tips here's things that you can do so i start with with my friend at the time a (laughs) podcast a podcast called the old school gamers and i still have like the logo around here somewhere i I posted it randomly every now and again on social media it was terrible terrible (laughs) terrible it was horrible but that's what got me started. Yeah. Um, and then, and that didn't last long. I, the, the the friendship that I had with the person I started with didn't last and long story, but that didn't last. So right. a, after, I don't know, might've been a couple months, we, we gave up on that. So, but even then I'd start meeting some other people that were kind of quote in the gaming community and her name's Elaine. Um, had this great idea because she knew someone that was looking to do something. She knew I would wanted to do it. And she put, put us together like, Hey, you guys should start a, a gaming show. So we got together, hit it off, brainstormed ideas. And we kept trying to come up with a name and we couldn't figure out like all the, what we thought were the good names were all taken back then. And his girlfriend at the time said, well, what about uncle gamer? We look it up. Uncle gamer, no one's taken that. So we started a podcast called Uncle Gamer. And this was <laughs> July-ish 06 up yeah. in there somewhere. July, August 06 up, up in there somewhere. So we start Uncle Gamer and we're doing that. And, you know, again, not good early on. It's not good. Um, I somehow, some way got invited to the Gears of War launch event wow. out in L.A., out in L.A., because again, this is end of 06. Mm-hmm. Um, I wound up meeting Luke Smith at this event. And back then, Luke Smith was at One Up and he was on One Up Yours, which was the show. That mm-hmm. was the gaming show. Garnet Lee, John Davidson, Shane. Oh, I'm forgetting Shane's last name, but but Shane, Luke, all of them were on there. That was the show. That was the number one gaming podcast show. Met Luke. We really hit it off. Good thing. Got him to come on Uncle Gamer, I remember. And then he gave us a shout out on One Up Yours. And I guess John Davidson listened to it, too, and gave a shout. Like, because at this point, now I'm starting to get better. And during this point in time, we added a third person. And Robbie was the original co-host of Uncle Gamer. And then I remember being on the TiVo forums. TiVo forums. Yeah. And there's a guy on there that's talking about gaming. And he seems really good. Great writer and all that. And his name was Jason Van Beveren, who is a dear friend of mine to this day. And I basically recruited him to come on Uncle Gamer. And he wind up being like the third host on there. Rob, Robbie decided he wanted to do it anymore at at a certain point. So he drops out. So now it's just me and Jay and we're doing Uncle Gamer. And now I'm kind of going into 2007. Cause like I said, one up yours has shouted us out, you know, starting to get a few connections in the in industry. Now, Chris Paladino, who's at dreamstation.cc back in those days, got a job at Xbox and he was working a uh, gamer score blog. This is early 07. He invited me up to Redmond for crackdown. And if you remember crackdown, the tie in with that was the halo three multiplayer beta. Like if you bought crackdown, you got that multiplayer beta, right? Yeah. 
So I got to go up up to Redmond and, you know, it was a community event and uh, got the tour of the Xbox campus. First time I met Major Nelson. Remember, E was still working there at the time. Got a tour, see what Xbox Live looked like, like the whole thing. We got to play Crackdown. And I'm so just amateur rookie, don't know what the hell I'm doing. Printed up these terrible business cards, and <laughs> it's it's just bad. It's just bad. Like I, I think back in those days, and I cringe a little bit. But um, those were those early days, and that's what kind of got got my foot in the door. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess I made enough of an impression at this event that Xbox then reached out to me and asked me if I wanted to be an Xbox MVP. And back then, being an Xbox MVP allowed you to kind of get a little sneak peek into some stuff that Xbox was working on. It was heavily NDA, the whole thing, but you're starting to meet people in the industry. Right. And I remember um, meeting someone from EA. So now I got connected with EA. Next thing I know, I'm starting to go to EA events. And wow. Um, I remember I went out to Orlando, Tiburon, it was like NCAA and Madden and it was Tiger Woods at the time. And um, somehow, some way, Oh, actually I know how, I because at this point now I'm starting to understand the industry a little bit and making connections. And I'll never forget. I caught wind and that we're in 2007 at this point. I catch wind that Activision is going to show off the next Call of Duty. And remember, they were doing the modern setting, right? This mm-hmm. is all new at the time. And it was going to be in L.A. And I found out who the community manager was. I spam emailed him. I basically bullied him into inviting me to this event because I wanted to go so bad <laughs> that eventually he invited me to this event. So I am one of the first people to go up to Infinity Ward in LA and we get to see Modern Warfare. Wow. And internally, it was they were calling it Call of Duty 3. Because Trey, right. because remember, Treyarch made World at War. That was technically three mm-hmm. Infinity Ward. So then obviously it became Call of Duty 4, which became Modern Warfare. So we got to see Modern Warfare and we got to see that multiplayer for the first time. And it's crazy for me to think now that I was literally watching one of the pivotal moments in gaming history. One of the first people to ever see that multiplayer. You don't realize it at the time, but you look right. back and go, oh, my God. Completely yeah. changed online multiplayer gaming Just completely forever. You're right, you know. Um, and this is Vince Ampella back then, Jason. What like it's crazy. I remember we all went to dinner, we went to a freaking movie. Like, it's nuts to think where like Vince Zampella is now with respawn mm-hmm. and, and success he's had with, with Titanfall and, and Star Wars. To think back then, oh yeah, I'm just walking in the studio, <laughs> you know. It's oh hey, it's Vince Ampella. you know, it, it's just crazy to think back, back, back then. Um but yeah, that was kind of my early start. So, so now the reason I bring that up now I'm getting connections with, within Activision and PR. So now I'm starting to expand more access and reach to things. So mm-hmm. I'll speed this up very quickly That's to fine. say now we're in E307 and this was the Santa Monica E3. And now Danny and I are great friends at this point. We help each other collaborate out. Just, just FYI, Danny's in the picture this entire time while all this stuff is going on because he, he's a friend. Um, and I remember we're at that E three Oh seven. This is, you know, Halo three, all, all that stuff that was coming out back then at, in Santa Monica at the hotels and Microsoft was at the Viceroy and they would have like, uh, they had like a windows gaming night where, night event then they had like a big last night big community event so all these industry people are there and you look and there's pictures online you see me in the background with danny's interviewing people mm-hmm. looking all mad um you know like cliff Pazinski's there because i guess this yeah because gears is out and i think gears was going on pc or something but there was some big deal with that but the reason i bring all this up is now this is around the time mass effect was going to come out right mm-hmm. and i'll never forget at, at that event, getting like a private demo of Mass Effect. So I'm seeing Mass Effect for the first time. That's Com- awesome. Completely just blew me away seeing that. I remember talking with Peter Molyneux and he's giving up all the secrets on Fable 2, like all the things that they were talking about to do for Fable 2. I remember it was it was Frankie and, um, and I'm talking Bungie now, but it, it was Frankie when he was still at Bungie and um, 
God, I'm blanking on the name. Anyways, doesn't matter. It was a couple <laughs> of bungee guys um, showing us Halo 3. Yeah. For the first time, it was that opening level, campaign level Halo Ooh, 3. We yeah. got to see all that. That was completely blew me away as well. But the reason I'm talking about all this is a lot of those early relationships yeah. back then still matter to this day. A lot of them that people that I met in that 07, 08 time frame when mm-hmm. I didn't know, I had no idea what the hell I was doing. Zero. <laughs> and, and it's, and a reason I, I'm saying that is, is because like, I remember I got to interview Ken Levine for Bioshock when I had yeah. no business being able to interview Ken Levine for Bioshock. And to this day, it's still one of the best interviews that I've ever done I, because I'm very, for me, I'd like to be prepared. I like to be very prepared. I like to do my research. I like to right. know everything I possibly can about a subject when I go into an interview. And, and I think he appreciated that even at that time. Another one that I did, this was 2010, was Casey Hudson uh, for Mass Effect 2. Um, I, 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 I take a great sense of pride with that one specifically because I remember at the time when that interview went out, if you went on the Bioware forums, it was being shared around everywhere and people thought it was one of the most in extensive interviews that Casey had done about Mass Effect 2, which again, one of the greatest games of all time to this day. Right. Um, so I'm very prideful of that. So, but it was because of the relationships that you build with, with people, people on, on the dev side, on the marketing side, on the PR side. And, and I say all that because when we get to 2023 now, that's almost looked at as a bad thing. Oh, you're a sellout. Oh, you're, sh- oh, you're doing this. You, you can't, you can't be friend and you're not necessarily friends with people, but you're respectful right. of what they do. And that's why I'm always, that's why I hate leaks. I, I can't stand leaks because I think people don't understand all the work that goes in on the marketing and PR side, you know, to, to present these games, they have a schedule and a plan on when this information is going to go out. And when you just frivolously leak something out, you're ruining someone's hard work. Yeah. Whether, whether you agree with it or not, someone that is someone's job that you just ruined because you wanted your five minutes of fame. Yeah. Um, and uh, again, I, I talk about those early days because like I said, that's where I kind of just, early learn my craft, so to speak. I mean, you know, people can obviously look at some of the things that I've done over the past few years and some of the interviews that I've done over the past few years. It was those moments back then that made all that possible now and right. gave me the, the the confidence and then the skill set to be able to do that stuff because you got to start somewhere and you're going to be terrible when you initially do anything. Oh, you, only get, you only get good at something with reps. And I've had a lot of reps, thankfully, over the years to be yeah. able to to practice and hone my craft and get better at this stuff. Um, but I, I don't know. I feel like I'm all over the place where I'm talking about this other than to just say those early I'm, I'm, I, I reflect on those early days with a lot of pride. I mean, were mistakes made? Of course, you're always going to make mistakes along the way. But I feel like I've, I've learned a lot. Because yeah, you learn from them. And I've definitely gotten better better at it. And here I am now in 2023. That's why I I, I say people see, and I'm doing air quotes, the successes I've had over the past few years. And, you know, the vast majority of people are are very respectful about it and gracious and kind and, you know, say say very nice things about it. And I'm very appreciative of that. And then, you know, you obviously got the negative Nancy's and you got the people that just simply want to tear you down. And, it's like, for me, it's like the people that see, oh, well, Xbox sent you something or, oh, you hosted this or you did that. You don't deserve it. And my thing is, you clearly don't know me, number right. one. And you don't know the years of hard work that it takes to get to a point where you're even in position to have such an opportunity. Like yeah. one thing, and I know I'm kind of steering that conversation. I apologize. No, no this is great, man. I love it. <laughs> You're doing but, great. Keep going. <laughs> but I, I, I'm a talker, and I, sometimes I, I talk too much. But no, um, no, I love it. This is this is all about your conversation about knowing about you. So continue. But one critique that I see about me online is really not a critique because it's ridiculous. I'm too positive. Like I just tweeted it the other day because someone had said something to me about 
they love that I'm excited about games. And mm-hmm. I quote tweeted, and I'm like, uh, yeah, of course. Why wouldn't you be excited about it? Gaming is supposed to be fun, right? Yeah, it's games. So, so why wouldn't I be excited about games? Why wouldn't I show enthusiasm for something that I'm passionate about? Because I right. am. And my motto is I'm going to be excited about a game until the game gives me a reason to not be. It's as simple as that, Um, you know, and I'll I'll just take that, that to say this cyberpunk 2077, as an example, anyone that has followed me over the years knows from 2018 until that game came out, my enthusiasm and passion for that game and how excited I was a couple viral moments came out of that so much. So to the point where I hosted their launch event during the pandemic when it came out in December. Right. I know a lot of people over at CD project red and great people and Look, bottom line, they screwed up. Game should have never come out when it did. They know it. We all know it. It is what it is. And I've received a lot of criticism over it because I was, quote unquote, a part of the front line of the the, the cheerleading section for that game. Yeah. And like, I still, it's been three years. I still still we'll see we'll, we'll get stuff over that and i'm not sitting in it now but you know obviously still see you they, part of the they, yellow chair gang yeah yeah which honestly one of the dumbest things ever yeah. it's, it's one of the dumbest things ever because the truth of the matter is this if back then any company it doesn't have to be cd project right but any company comes to you and like hey we want to send you this you're not going to say no and if you say you're going to say no you're not telling the truth you're going to say you're going to be like hey, of course why wouldn't you it was yeah it was an exciting moment. And remember, we're in the pandemic at this point. There's a lot going on. I'm not using yes. that as an excuse because I have no shame for it at all. It's true. Yep. But it's a thing of that was the quote unquote gotcha moment. And, and, and the one mistake that I did make with, with, with that game was I remember when they put out the um, they put out those curated videos of it running on the on the Xbox One X and the PS4 Pro, I believe. Right. Mm-hmm. And it was obviously curated by them and edited by them. And I saw the videos and I exclaimed on Twitter, yep, the console versions look great. You've got nothing to worry about. That was a mistake. And the tweet's still up. I'll never delete it because it is what it is. I said what I said. Right. To this day, people will still reference that as me trying to trick people in the marketing. Right. But my counter to that and my counter will always be to that. You clearly did not watch my review on Kind of Funny. Because right. in that same month of that same year, I did not recommend the game once I had the final game. Yeah. Bottom line. Yeah. Because, and, and it was a lessons learned for me in that previews are great because I went hands on with the, um, it was cloud streaming again because of the pandemic. But I, I, I was, a, I, I got a preview of it and I played the, the prologue of it. I'll still say to this day, you go play that prologue. I mean, it's one of it was one of the more polished portions of the game. Mm -hmm. So, of course, you're going to play that and think, oh, man, this is going to be great. But I've learned I've learned a lesson from that, that while previews are are, are good, it's nice to get hands on early, you know. Temper expectations, even coming out of that, no matter how good the preview may be, be like, well, I need to see more. Like, as an example, that was kind of my mantra with Redfall. I remember. Mm -hmm when we did the preview for Redfall and we played, I played about an hour of it. Right. I remember we, we sat down with the associate creative director, interviewed him and kind of gave my thoughts. And I said, him, I was like, I go, this seems like a decent start, but I need to see more. And the irony is what I played in that first hour was probably the best part of the game that you would have played right. because it only went downhill from there. And there were a lot of frustration and pain points. We obviously know what Redfall is and what what you know what what it became and again right. another game that never should have seen the light of day in 2023 in my opinion right. um but it's a lessons learned and that's why i say you're going to make mistakes doing this we all do that that was one of my more glaring mistakes that that i made and obviously was on a literally on a global stage um right. to be able to do that but it's not something that i shy away from but yeah. it's also a thing where I guess that's my gotcha moment. So when you when you have and I, I, just, I just call them bad actors, when you have these bad actors online that just live to see you fail, that's really the only thing they can refer back to every right. time. Um, instead of you're too, you're and like I was saying before, you're too positive. You're too excited. About, yeah, I am because I, I'm a positive person. Why am I going to dwell in negativity? I absolutely will not do that. Now, look, I'm not saying 
that I, I can't dive in the mud every now and again. And, you know, when someone says something ridiculous to me, I've definitely <laughs> well, had some, some, a little bit. I've had some private conversations with, with some people, you know, in this community that I didn't appreciate their public comments and I let them know, but that's for, that's our conversation. It's not for public consumption. I'm not right. the type to go on these public displays of doing, you know, all, all that stuff. Cause I think it's silly and I think it's, I think it's immature, but the one advice that I would give any creator out there is accept criticism. I, I, I definitely take accept criticism and feedback and try and learn from it and grow from it. But when criticism just turns into harassment, you have to draw a line just for your own mental health and oh, yeah. your own, your, your own well being and self respect that you can't let people try and continuously tear you down when you know, that's not what you stand for or what's, or, or that's what you do. Um, I will just say personally for me, Anything that you've seen me do on Gamertag Radio, on my personal YouTube channel, and kind of funny or any of that, or hosting on, on, on a stage or whatever, I'm just being myself. I'm just giving you my honest, genuine opinion about anything. Like, as an example, uh, another critique that I see a lot is people get upset that um, I champion Game Pass. Yeah, of course I do. You wanna know why? Because I'm a father with three <laughs> kids, and mm -hmm. I remember in the 80s, wanting a game and my parents saying no because they were super expensive yep I, I i when i talk i always talk as a consumer always i don't care what little perk i might get hell oh, we're gonna send you a review code or you get a control whatever because yes i'm very lucky and fortunate that i, I I've, I've had those things happen to me and i 100 percent because it can all be gone tomorrow right right so whenever i view something or i look at something I'm looking at it from the standpoint of if I have to go buy it as a consumer, what would I do? Yeah. So I'm always looking for a value because why wouldn't I? I'm, I'm not in the business to give away my money for, for no reason. I want value for my right. dollar always. We so all do, yeah. when I look at something like Game Pass, the reason I'm such a fan of it is, is because I, I it provides value. Even right now, my kids take full advantage of it. They don't have to ask me for nothing. There's plenty of games they can go play and they can discover on their own. They don't yeah. need me to go run out and buy a game. And you know, look, they're a little look, they're a little entitled in that way. Yeah. But that that's a good thing because I think it's a it's a great value yes. that they get to go play all these games. They get to do what I couldn't do at their age, is the way that I look at it. Right. Yes. So of course I'm gonna champion that and talk about it. Look, all the stuff about is it sustainable and all that, that's not my job to worry about. Right. It's just simply not. That's that's a Microsoft job, not mine. So I'm going to enjoy this value as long as it's there. Now, if it goes away at some point, then you obviously adjust, adjust and you move on. But to sit here and argue about these things consistently online and try and demean people for something that does not affect you. No, no, no <laughs> you don't have you don't have to buy yeah. it. You have a choice. You have a choice. You know. Xbox at no point forces anyone to subscribe to Game Pass. Mm -mm. I mean, technically, I guess you do now because the bottom tier is called Game Pass, but really it's just Xbox Live Gold. But yeah. the point is, if you don't want to invest in their subscription service and you want to go buy a Starfield or a Halo at $70 a clip, knock yourself out. Right. Like me, me personally, I'm a cheapskate. No, thank you. I'll, I'll just subscribe and, and play it that way. But yeah. on the flip side, I am a gamer and I love games. So when it comes to PlayStation, they obviously don't offer that. So yep. guess what? I want to play Spider-Man 2. I'm going to have to go spend 70 bucks to go play Spider-Man 2 or yep. God of War or whatever the case. And I will go do that for the games that I want to go play and I want to go enjoy. Same with Nintendo. We, look, we know Nintendo. Nintendo, like, you're buying our stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you, look, you, you can say whatever you want, but you're going to buy it and, and you're going to do it. That's why I, I've been joking around about this next Switch. I don't think it's going to be backwards compatible. And people are like, how dare are you crazy? It's, I'm like, look. I'm setting myself up to not be disappointed because right. if there isn't any backwards compatibility, it's Nintendo. You're buying the Switch 2 anyways. When they show you that new Mario that's going to come out and launch, you're going to go, oh my God, and you're going to go buy it. So I'm just setting myself up to not be disappointed. If there is backwards compatibility with it, fantastic. If not, that's Nintendo. That's what they do. So Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I agree with that 100%. One thing I do want to do, do want to jump in and say that, uh, um, in your defense, um, you weren't the only one that got kind of um, bamboozled by uh, by CD Projekt Red and by uh, 
Redfall because I mean there was a lot of controversy. You were presented with what they wanted you to see, yeah, in the narrative they released. So yeah. and and that after the game came out and then your position was what it was, that to me lends you so much more credibility than somebody trying to quote unquote catch you in a gotcha moment. There are a lot of people out there that that are jealous is is the word for it of different creators because they're either their ecosystem that they're fans of doesn't seem to uh you know doesn't seem to bring that to the table um I, you seem like me that you're a gamer first yeah and it's not like you know i mean i have a playstation 5 i have a i have a switch i have you know i have a lot of old classic things i have a pc I, you know i have a, a, but the ecosystem i prefer myself is xbox because of game pass right and it's just because it's it's a great value and they say they're making money and i can see how they could be making money at it and if somebody else doesn't quote unquote see that who cares i I feel a lot of it is because they're wishing they had that on their system of choice and that's understandable you know i'm sure i i would love to have that kind of ecosystem on the PlayStation myself to be able to pay a monthly fee and be able to access those things. That'd be great. They will never do that, or at least not anytime soon because they're the market leader and they don't see the the need for it. Exactly. You there look, the competition is what drives innovation. This is the way that I look at it. If you go back, if you go back two generations to the 360 and the PS3 era, ironically enough, the PS3 globally at the end wound up outselling the PS3 or, or the 360. Right. But the 360, for all intents and purposes, was the market leader. They were setting the tone for what's happening. And because PlayStation needed to recapture that market share, that's how we originally got PS, PS Plus, right? Mm-hmm. This is this is how you you get them lowering the price of 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 their of their of their PS3. Because remember, they originally PS3 was six hundred dollars. Yep. King Kukuraga was like, you need like 12 jobs and you'll do it, you know. But they had to adjust because Microsoft put pressure on them. And then Microsoft obviously stumbled with the Xbox One. And if you go back to um, shameless plug, but the interview we did with Phil Spencer, he said it himself that that was the start of the digital age. And yes. they have they screwed up because now PlayStation has a foothold on the right. digital side with the ecosystem. It's harder to pull people away from their digital content when that digital content is always available to you and it's not just on a disc right so right. microsoft has a lot of work to do and 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 i always find it funny so when i was originally talking about my early history with xbox i was setting it up to say i'm i owe a lot to xbox to be in a position that i am right now especially mm-hmm. their early days with their engagement with the community and all that and the relationships that i was able to establish so this is why I'm on XCast. This is why I've been part of Gamertag Radio, things like that, because I, I, I've I, been hypercritical. If you go to the early Xbox One, if you listen to those episodes of Gamertag Radio, I was extremely critical of the Xbox One, to, so much to the point it was sitting unplugged and I wasn't using it for like a few years. I just, there was no relevance for it for me, right? right. I was on the PC and I was on the PlayStation. Um, But it was 2016 that really changed my mind and cemented me to where I am today. There was, they used to do these, this thing called the spring showcase Xbox. Um, and they did one in San Francisco in 2016. And Phil Spencer gave a keynote at that spring showcase. And if you think about it, he'd only been the head of Xbox for a couple of years at that point. Right. And I'll never forget. He gave this keynote and it wasn't for public consumption. I really wish it should have been. Everything. And when I tell you everything that they are doing in 2023, he talked about then. And it's crazy when you look back and think about it, that they'd been building up their infrastructure and services to where they are today. They had the foresight back then for that. Mm -hmm. Xbox Play Anywhere, cloud gaming, gamepad, all these things they were talking about back then, backwards compatibility, all that stuff they were talking about back then. And that was when the light bulb went on with me and I go, I see where they're going. I see what they're doing. They're going to fix this. And that was my, kind of my moment where I started reintegrating back into Xbox and understanding and kind of being a person trying to 
for lack of a better term, be a voice of reason when it comes to Xbox. It was like, I, I get people can't see it now, but I'm, I'm looking five, seven years down the road and I'm seeing where this is going. And even right now, I still see where it's going now. Clearly, they have had a setback with the start of the uh, of this this generation. Mm -hmm. You can blame it on the pandemic. You can blame it on whatever you want. That that's fine. But they are not where they should be three years right. into this. They're simply not. And I think they will admit that as well. But I'm I I can see beyond this. I I almost feel like as as Starfield and Forza and Avowed and Hellblade Two as the next six months of games are starting to come out. I can kind of see them finally hitting that cadence that Matt Booty has talked about and Phil Spencer has talked about where yeah. they're going to have an internal release, you know, from from one of their internal studios every quarter. They got enough studios to do it now. This Activision thing obviously is only going to enhance that even more. Oh, yeah. I can see it now. Is cloud gaming the primary way you're going to play games anytime soon? Absolutely not. But it's a nice supplement to the way that you play games. We can argue and debate about should they have done a series x and an s whatever it is what it is those things are reality at this point game pass is a thing right now we're starting to see even more value being added to that mm -hmm. as well so i like talking see i love talking about that stuff i love being able to look ahead and try and understand where i think the industry is going and how how things are happening and that's why you know, the old way was you buy your console, you play our games on the one console and that was it. Clearly, Xbox is seeing beyond that. It's not that Xbox is abandoning the console, right. but they're like, why are we limiting our games to just the one console? Let's we own Windows. Let's put our games on PC. Right. Mm -hmm. Let's have a cloud component to it. Like I'm I'm reviewing the, the Samsung Gaming Hub right now. Let's just nice. tell people get a controller and you pair your controller to the TV. You can play your game right on there. You don't even need a console for that. Obviously the mobile, like I got the, the ROG ally. That's basically a native game pass machine, right? Yeah. I, what is What is their, their, their marketing term? Basically they're basically bringing the, the games to where the people are instead of having the people come to where the games are. They're reversing yeah. it. I think that's smart. Not everything <laughs> has to stay the same, right? And, you know, we can do this dumb console war stuff and my plastic box is better than yours and blah, 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 blah. I don't care. Like, right. you, like you said, I'm a gamer first. I just want to play great games. Let me play the great games that I want to play where I want to play them. Like, yep. I, ironically enough, I vast majority play my games on PC versus on console. Mm -hmm. But that's my preference. Yeah. But I have no problem playing on console. But it's great to have that choice of where I want to play, where I don't have to go out in the living room or yeah. in the kid's room to go go play uh, an Xbox game. I can sit right here in my office on this PC and play those same games. And I think that's great. And they carry over. That's why I love to play anywhere and the, the, the cloud saves to where I can hop back and forth between multiple platforms and play the games, pick up my saves where I want. I think that's great. I love tech. I love that this is where we're headed with this stuff versus keeping things static, static where, where they've been, you know, the past mm -hmm. decade or so. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. So that's just kind of me. I, look, I know I'm super long with it. I know you said it's fine. I just feel like I talk too much, but um, that, that's, that's just kind of me. That's just who yeah. I am. I, I try to go like on, on these shows and just talk about the things that I enjoy. Yeah. Um, when, when it's time to be critical of things, I will 100% be critical of things as they're yeah. needed, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to be I'll critical just that. for the, for the sake of being critical. I don't right. think that makes any sense to me. You know, you, you praise the things that need to be praised and you criticize the things that need to be criticized. And, and I think if that's you completely fair. If you don't criticize, they may not realize that exactly. there's an issue and they can't fix it if they don't know about it. And it's not necessarily that if especially with something they can tweak and fix mm -hmm. that's easy, that they might not have looked at from that perspective. It's just, you know, oh, OK. Or maybe gives us an option that we didn't have before. I, I things. Yeah, I can tell you. And this isn't just an Xbox thing. This is across across the industry, multiple studios and, mm -hmm. and people that I've been able to talk to over the years. To your exact point, they want to they want to hear the bad. They want to hear what what are we not getting right so that we can fix it so that it is right. Because right. when you're making these games and when you got your head down and, and you're in your bubble, you may not realize that the thing that you think is a great idea, the vast majority of people are going to look at it and go, mm, wait, mm, no, that's not a good idea. And actually, I can give you a great example of that. Remember 
this might have been early 2022, 2021. I can't remember. It might have been 2021. But remember when Xbox <laughs> tried to raise the price of Xbox Live Gold? Oh, yes. So, clearly, internally, they thought that was a good idea. Because yeah. look how quickly they backtracked when they got the public outcry. Under but, 24 hours. Yeah. They, had, yeah. they were. Boop. Yeah. yeah. Because I remember I had to hop on. We had recorded XCast and PR had reached out to me that evening and I had to jump on and and basically re- record a disclaimer because, you know, we're talking like, hey, this ain't a good idea. Like, what, what the hell are they doing? And then PR reached out to me and was like, nope, we're, 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 we're rolling it back. It was a mistake. And I had to jump on and record something real quick to kind of put a disclaimer on that episode that they rolled it back. But that's a, a great example of just because in, in your bubble, you think this is a great idea. That doesn't necessarily mean that your consumers are going to think it's a great idea. So there's a way to provide that critical feedback and still be respectful by it. And, that, and I think that's my main thing. That's what I think a lot of online personalities, let's just keep it that way, aren't getting some of our younger folks that have not been around the right. block a few times. You can criticize something, but be respectful at the same time. Exactly. Like I've had people say, fire this person because this game's not good. They are not going to listen to you when you sit there and say, fire someone. When you yeah. have no idea what's going on internally, why things are happening the way that they are. The way to communicate that is, hey, this thing about this game, I don't like this feature. Like the one thing that I try to do, if I'm going to criticize something, I try to provide a solution at the same time. I'm not saying that's a solution that's going to fix it, but here at least I'm 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 thinking about the right. issue and I, and I'm I'm trying to find a way to fix it. So I'm providing what well, here's what I would do. Maybe they take that advice, maybe they don't, but they're going to be way more apt to listen to you to say that I don't like this because of X, Y, and Z, and here's ABC on how I think we can resolve it. You're going to be a lot more receptive to that kind of feedback versus your game sucks. Fire this person, fire that person. Like, come on. Because that always really, works, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because, okay, you're fired. Now we have no solution. And we have no, that, make, that makes no sense. Let's so, put you in charge. <laughs> yeah. So that that's kind of where I am when, when I see a lot of the discourse online and just feeding the negativity. And yeah. I don't know if you saw... <laughs> I had uh, and and I clipped it and and put it online. This is the beginning of the week. So when I was on Gamer Tag Radio, I, I swear Danny teed me up on this one, where he was asking me about just some of the criticisms that we've seen around Starfield not going gold and the lack of marketing and all that kind of stuff. And not that we're going right. to talk about the game itself, but um, my whole rant on it was is I I just think a lot of it's a grift. I do. I really do think it's a grift. It's it's one thing about content creation that I see today that I just do not think is genuine. When I see certain people go out there and they will make content and they're saying things that you can look in their face and know they don't believe what they're saying themselves. You're saying something negative to spark a reaction, to spark engagement, to get people upset at you, to get video clips of you going viral to have people click on your links and go to your videos. I'm not a fan of that way of building an audience. I'm just not. Yeah, I, I think. And, and look, negativity spreads a lot quicker than positivity. I get it. But I would rather slowly, organically grow my audience the right way by being genuine to who I am versus being a persona online that we know is not real, that is literally created to upset you. Right. And we see that a lot. And we see that a lot in the gaming space now. And it just it just bums me out. It, it really does. Like I said, I try to not make too much of a public spectacle of it. But when someone asks me, I, I will give you my opinion on it because it's just how I yeah. feel. When, when I see these ridiculously fake outrage videos, right? It just, I'm like, come on. You, you don't believe that. I know you don't believe that. Yeah. And, and, and I think the comical thing with me is some of these people I know I've met yeah. them. 
and mm-hmm. I've had real conversations with him. And 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 I guess that's where where the disappointment comes from because it's like, come on, dude, I met you. Number one, you don't talk like that. You don't act <laughs> like that in real life. But you're doing that in front of the camera now because you want to upset someone. I I call it the Tucker Carlson, where Tucker Carlson purposely. Oh, hey, I'm just I'm just asking questions. <laughs> like, <laughs> come, on, come on, man. We know we know what you're doing. So I wish we could get away from that more in this. But unfortunately, that's it drives engagement, it which, does. It which does. drives mon- which drives monetization. And that's yeah. the end of the day. That's the name of the game for a lot, a lot of this stuff versus having real, honest, genuine conversations about gaming, the good and the bad. Because there's clearly yeah. you need there's the, the bad parts that we need to talk about. And I'm very open to talk about them, but I want to have an honest conversation about them. I don't want to have a bad faith discussion about this stuff. You can talk about the good, we can celebrate the good, we can talk about the bad, and we can critique it and try to provide solutions accordingly. And I and I think that's fair. And that's what that's what I like to do. That's what I want to do. So, like I said, when you see me on a platform. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying, like, I just had a conversation about the Series S on XCAS. And it wasn't, uh, they should get rid of the S and it was a mistake. It was like, okay, let's talk about where the S is three years into this generation now. Here's the positives of it. Here's the negatives of it. Where do we go from here? That basically was the conversation, Mm -hmm. right? And then I gave my opinion on what I would have done if I was in charge. I don't necessarily know if I would have had an S, I probably would have just had an X that did not have a Blu-ray drive and all digital X. Yeah, it probably wasn't $299. It was probably more. But now that takes any potential bottleneck out of the equation. Right. Because your, your hardware is consistent across the board. That's what I would have done. But again, I'm not internally there. I don't know why certain decisions were made. I'm sure there was a logical, reasonable explanation why they did what they did. And for 90 percentile of the games out there, yes, is not a problem. And even the issues we have seen have been somewhat minor, but it clearly was heightened by Baldur's Gate 3, just not releasing on the Xbox at all. Right. And that's what I think has kind of re-sparked some of this, plus some of the whispers we've seen from various developers. But it's okay to have that conversation, is my point. It isn't a, oh, let's burn Microsoft to the ground because of it. It's, <laughs> yeah. let's talk about it. Let's is there something we're missing here? Right. And and my whole thing about it was I would just love Xbox to be on the record about the S like, let's have a conversation about the X an official conversation about the S versus rumor and speculation about the S that way we can once and for all, here it is, here's the video or here's the Xbox wire post talking about the series S and any potential limitations that it has, or if it doesn't have any at all, is it just simply a case of, yeah, the S is more work on the development side. So some of these developers are going to simply need more time to get the games working the way that they should on the S versus the X, you know, maybe it's that simple. I don't know, but I wanted to at least have the conversation about it. If that would be a good conversation to have. And and I hope that at some point uh, on one of your shows, you can get somebody from, um, from Xbox, probably one of the uh, developers, designers, to sit down with you and and maybe talk about it. Now it's three years out. You know, I know the intention. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. I was just going to say, and let's be clear, it doesn't have to be me. <laughs> I'm well, just, of course, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's but just you. Hey. You are very genuine, a genuine, and and I think that uh, you know you're gonna you're gonna your takes um, are gonna are gonna probably you're going to be open-minded and listen compared to some people who would be the gotchas or the, or the, or the, Oh, what about this? What about this? Or why didn't you do this? You know what I mean? There's, there's a matter of listening. And then there's also a matter of, of just putting up a wall and trying to have somebody climb over it. But, but to be fair, yeah, they're not going to go to a platform that is known for doing the gotchas. Why why, why would you even put yourself in that situation? That doesn't make any sense. You know, but I, I could easily, seeing them sitting down with Ryan McCaffrey as an example to talk about that because, because Ryan and Ryan's a good friend. Ryan is critical, but he's fair to, to the point that I've been saying this entire time. Ryan is not afraid to voice his opinion about the things that he doesn't necessarily like that Xbox is doing, but Ryan will also at the same time provide a solution for what he thinks they should be doing. And that's all you can ask for, for, for any of this stuff. 
Well, as as we start to to wrap things up, because um, um, I don't want to I don't want to waste waste the rest of your day, but I man, it's been so so great talking to you and and getting to know more about you, uh, which I greatly appreciate. Um, but what I did want to um, I get two things I wanted to ask you before I let you go, mm-hmm. and uh, one of them was like, so how did it come about, and 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 what were your feelings when I guess somebody at Microsoft approached you to be on the showcase? And to do those interviews, and then and then I guess a showcase later, you know, you're 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 flown off, and you're doing these a wonderful interviews, uh, well, flight simulator. I mean, those to me, those are awesome, and I'm so glad that they got you to do it because you're very genuine, and then also uh, you really seem to enjoy yourself doing those uh, doing those interviews and doing those, and you and they, you were absolutely brilliant in that first those sit down interviews. The uh, I guess the after show from last year. And uh, what was that like for you? So uh, before I answer the the main part, I'm, I'm going to go to the flights and stuff. So this last one that I did uh, in Budapest uh, was, was wild because it was we shot it in early May and it was so humid in Budapest. So when you see me in those out, outside shots and we're filming whatever, trust me when I tell you when they said cut. I am ripping that jacket off of me because I'm just dying the entire time. The only time it was good outside was when we were on the boat out, out on the river because mm. obviously it was a good breeze or whatever. But man, it was uh, it was so just so hot in, in there. And it was so funny because we're walking around Budapest and, you know, obviously I got a camera crew with me or whatever. And I got the shades on in this jacket and we're in like all these touristy areas. People were like coming up to me and they're going who are you? And I go, I'm nobody. And they're like, no, 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 no. You're somebody. You would not have a camera crew with you. And you're walking around with shades on. You're someone. And I'm like, trust me, I'm nobody. We're just, we're just shooting something fun. But uh, yeah, it's, it's been a great experience doing this stuff with York uh, for the flight sim. It's, it's been a lot of fun. And to answer your question originally. So yeah, when it, it was, okay. So, so again, here, true story. You want to know how I got picked to to do the Xbox showcase? Yeah. Because I said something on Twitter. Nice. I said randomly, not even at Xbox. I just said randomly that I would love to be able to host something. Because again, now we're still in the pandemic at this point. Um, I would I would love to be able to one day host something. You know, that's all I said, really. They saw that. And that's what sparked the idea. Hey, let's bring them in. Let's try this and, and do it. So they're very secretive when, when it comes to these showcases, as you, I'm sure, can guess. So mm-hmm. when they originally reached out to me and I'm signing NDAs, all this kind of stuff, very cryptic on it was just like, hey, you come up Seattle for a week. We're going to have you film something. I really did not know what I was doing until the day I went on the set. Didn't. Wow. I'd never hosted anything in my life, never read off a teleprompter in my life, any of that stuff. That was all very new to me. But to, to Xbox's credit, they allowed me to be a part of the script process. So I was able to, um, like the things I'd be reading off the teleprompter, I was able to kind of edit and phrase mm-hmm. in the way I would say it versus yeah. what a writer would say. So I was definitely involved in all that kind of stuff, which was awesome. The sit down interviews, all of that, the questions I would ask, I was phrasing them in the ways that I would ask a, a question. Um, so it was a very fun experience, very memorable experience. It's something that I'll always be very appreciative of that. I got a couple of, cause I hosted the showcase extended that year and gamescom that mm-hmm. year. Mm-hmm. And then I've been doing the flight sim stuff every year since. So like even this year, the format that they just changed it to like with Tina being the host T- and Tina, you know, she's be at IGN. She's so mm-hmm. awesome. Um, it dawned on me and and her and I had talked about this um, when we're in LA for summer game fest, because I, I never get to see the final product until it's actually out. Right. So I always have to rely on other people telling me that are in the editing thing, if it's good or not. So I'll never forget. I'd ran an Aaron Greenberg in LA and he had saw it and he was like, Oh my God, it's so good. Oh my God. I love it. Cause all my favorite son. And I'm like, really? Cause I, I don't know how it's going to turn out. There's right. so many things that we shot that didn't wind up in it, that it's, it's amazing how they edit it. So I'm always curious. Um, and then I remember talking to Tina and she was just saying how, how good she was like, Oh, it's so good. And she reminded me, she goes, do you know 
you were the only non Xbox employee that's in, in this. I'm like, wow, really? And then when you go back and watch it, I'm like, yeah, it's true. I'm wow. literally the only, only one, you know? So it's like little things like that, that I'm just very appreciative of and feel very honored and lucky that I, I get to do those things. Right. Mm -hmm. Because obviously it's a very small percentage of people that ever get an opportunity to, to do all that kind of stuff. So the fact that they trusted me over, over these past few years to, to be a part of their, basically their, their messaging. I mean, let's, let's yeah. just be, be honest about it to be a part of their messaging uh, for one of their big franchises, which, which is flight sim has been, it's been awesome. Really. It really has been. Um, well, so, I, yeah, very I, gotta say, that. I gotta say from a person outside looking in, you know, watching it live when it, when it happened type thing, um, you know, your performance as uh, doing the interviews and on the flight sim stuff, you seem like you had been doing it for years. I mean, it was, it was, and I mean that, that, that is the way you, you pulled it off. You were very, you seemed very comfortable and it seemed like, you know, it was just, you did a great job and I'm not trying to I'm not buttering you up because you're on the show right now. I'm, I'm just genuinely saying that it was like, it didn't show that if that was your first time doing those kind of things that that first one you did, it didn't show. It looked like you've been doing it for years and you'd done the thousand of them. It oh, really was that good. I, I, I appreciate that. I, I really do. But yeah, it's just, I, <laughs> I, I equate it to, to my years of being a child of the eighties and watching a lot of TV. <laughs> yeah. I just emulate all the things that I've, I've seen over the years, but well, no, I, 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 I appreciate you saying that it again, it's remember, just a moment in time that, you know, I always appreciate. Nice. Nice. It was it it was good. It was fun. And 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 I don't know what the future holds. And we haven't talked about anything. So I'm just saying that as as a person who who has watched you and has seen you on other things and and even seen you jump in chats on one of my shows, and it was like Paris is here. That's so cool. You know, it, it, I know you think it's not a big deal to you because you're a, a member of the community and you like it being. But I think it's great and uh, that you still do that. Um, because you like to be, I guess, on the pulse and like to, you know, to check out things. I think it's, uh, I think it's fantastic. And, and someone who's now creating content myself, um, it's much appreciated. So we'll, uh, we'll leave that at that. And, and I guess uh, the last question I want to ask you as we wrap things up, I want to elaborate on what you just said, because to, and I appreciate all the kind words, but you're right. I am a part of the community and I am no better than you or anyone else that is watching, listening, creating. I'm no better than anybody else. I'm, I'm truly not. And that is part of the reason why I do hop in chats. This is why I am a lurker. This is why I will <laughs> jump into a space that might be super toxic to try yeah. and be a voice of reason, because I, I do try to lean on the years of experience that I've had and provide some different perspectives to it. But I also want to hear what people are talking about. So this is why I will lurk in your chat. I may be in there more than you think. And nice. listen and try to understand what people are talking about, what their concerns are, what they're liking, things like that, because that adds to my own perspective. You know, when when I do hop on an X cast or whatever, or when I do mm -hmm. get a chance to talk to a Phil Spencer, because if you remember that interview, I specifically told him, here's what I am hearing from the community about yes. X, Y and Z, because I am listening. Right. Yeah. I don't think my opinion is better than anybody else's. Um, I've just been lucky enough that. I, I know my voice is heard by certain people. So I try to make sure that I am properly re representing the community as a whole when it, when it comes to stuff like that. But no, I, like I said, I, I really appreciate what you said, but no, I don't think it's a big deal at all that I'm in, 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 in a chat or, or anything like that. Because like I said, your opinion, your perspective is no more valid than mine. It really isn't. Well, let me, let me put it this way that I appreciate the fact that, you will at least present the opinion of others when you are in the position that you are able to maybe talk with Phil or, you know what I'm saying? Those kind of, those the Avenue you, 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 you at least are listening to other people and not, which there's a lot of people in the community, all different kinds of communities that are gaming that are, that don't listen to other people that just have, you know, it's, it's their way or the highway. And there's always to me, you know, you can smash a uh, a pancake and you flip it over and it's always got another side to it. No, ma no exactly. matter what, there's always another side. Yep. E even if you don't agree with it, 
even if it's the burnt side, I'm just kidding. But, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, that's, that's, that's the point on that. So, anyway, so anyway, um, I, but like I said, the, the last question I have for you is to wrap things up. So I always ask this of everybody, what is the game? And we're going to, we're going to take Starfield off the plate because it's considered coming out and we're just going to take that off the plate. So we're going to say, what is a game that is coming out that everybody's heard of? So in other words, it's been officially announced that you're most looking forward to. Easy Spider-Man too. There you go. There you go. So and and, and is it have you, you've enjoyed the other games? Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Really enjoyed enjoy the first two games. Highly anticipating this one. Uh, yeah, I'm day one. I'm I'm very intrigued to see how they're going to handle Craven and Venom. Ooh, you yeah. know, yeah. So really looking forward to it. Yeah, it's 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 that is exciting. It is it is going to be good and fun to play. Yeah. Uh, Paris. Uh, Thank you so much uh, for being on here today and for sharing your stories. Uh, it has absolutely been wonderful having you on. I can't thank you enough for your time. Uh, and, uh, and and we'll take it to heart that uh, you're one of us and you're just a person just like anybody else. And you are. But um, but the fact that you take the time to do things like this is appreciated. And I just wanted you to know that we do appreciate you and you doing this. So thank you so much for doing it. No, I, I, again, thank you for having me on here. I, I truly appreciate it. I love being able to have these kind of conversations. And um, yeah, anytime, any, any, anytime, like I said, I'll, I'll, I'll be lurking. Don't worry. Nice. <laughs> nice. Uh, nice. But uh, no, anytime. I really appreciate you having okay. me. Okay. Well, tell everybody where they can find you. And plus everything's going to be in the description below, but go ahead and tell everybody. Sure. So you can find me on, on social media. I'm at vicious six, nine, six everywhere. So, so that's simple enough. Um, as far as platforms go, um, I'm on Gamertag Radio and I'm over on Kind of Funny uh, and I'm a co-host on their Xbox show, The X-Cast. Super nice, super nice. Uh, and, uh, and and I've seen you even, uh, you know, pop up on other, uh, other um, I guess, uh, podcast. Uh, you were, I guess, a guest on Kea Sante and uh, Everborn Saga podcast. <laughs> Again, an 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 another one I lurk on all the time. Like real quick before we get out of here. Yes. Yeah, I, that one ended up because again, I'm a lurker and I listen to stuff <laughs> and I, I don't even remember what they were talking about, but I basically started talking smack in the chat. Yeah. And next thing I know, they had me come on unofficially. I came on one time and then officially I came on another time. And we actually have like a little private group chat going right now where me and uh, Everborn, I, and, and I don't, and I'm very unserious when I say this, but I give him grief about his Sonic fandom all, all yes. the time. And we, <laughs> and, we, and we just go back and forth on that. It's just a lot of fun. Yeah, it, that is, it, it is, it is very funny. But yeah, that's the Circle Podcast with Kay Asante and Everborn. And uh, and uh, again, thank you so much for being here. And thanks, everybody, for joining us here at Outbreak Gamers.